There we go. Um, want to remind you guys, Monday is our turn-in day for Operation Christmas Child. So for those of you that are participating in all of that, I know it was a short uh, window this year. I probably should have started it a couple of weeks ago, but I didn't. Uh, so uh, National Collection Week, because I don't get to choose that guy. National Collection Week is next week. Uh, so if you're going to participate, rather than just hold on to boxes for next school year, you got to participate on Monday, all right? Uh, so if you could help us out, we would appreciate that as we look to present the gospel uh, the world round, not just to Frederick County. All right, this time, though, I'd like to sing, or I'd like you guys to sing with me, I'd Rather Have Jesus. Let me start with this guy. Who's up? I see Marcelo first. I saw his hand first. I'm so sorry. It's all good. Oh, there's my bell. There's my So there are three verses that are loaded on the PowerPoint. We're only going to sing the first two, so you don't have to worry about the third one there, Marcelo. Uh, there are a number of awesome hymns inside our hymnal, a lot of awesome Christian songs. But if I, I'm not a big guy for favorites. So sometimes people will ask me, what is my favorite this, my favorite that, uh, such as like my favorite food. Uh, typically, my favorite food is the food that's on my plate. I like to eat. I really don't care what I'm eating. It's not that big of a deal, all right? Uh, they'll ask me favorites in a couple of different veins. What's my favorite color? The color I'm wearing? The color's not a big deal to me. Who cares, right? It's just, just something that's there. Today, my favorite color is blue, unless you look at my tie. And then I have no idea what my favorite color is because it's all, out of, all, all over the place. Actually, I can't say my favorite color scheme is this tie, but it's a cool tie, so we'll leave that alone. But when it comes to hymns, while I have many favorites, if there was going to be one hymn that just speaks to me, it'd be this guy right here. I'd rather have Jesus. Every single time I sing this, I used to sing this uh, to my kids as they went to bed um, as uh, one of our good night songs right there. Uh, but anyways, it's, uh, it's just one of those songs that reminds me in the difficulties of life and in even sometimes the non-difficulties, the great things in life, you know, all that focus, it's pretty worthless unless it's truly a focus on Jesus Christ. So hopefully you'll enjoy singing it as much as I'm going to enjoy singing it. Go ahead and stand up with me, and we're going to sing the first two verses of I'd Rather Have Jesus. <clears throat> mm -hmm. All right, my voice is in tune, so we're good to go. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. So love is just the way it is. Let's move on to verse 2. I'd rather have Jesus than hands of applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. Some words. Hopefully you listen to the words, not just uh, sang along to the tune, uh, but a great song here. You guys can be seated, and of course, let's bring Pastor Gleiser up, uh, the man of the hour, and you guys give him your full and utmost attention.
even when it comes to handing out the uh, the the uh, remote to run the PowerPoint. You guys have fun with just about anything, that's for sure. And I hope you guys are through stepping on each other's feet back there and uh, and uh, took care of each other like that. You know, you've heard about stepping on people's feet. I just got I just saw it uh, take place back there, and you got caught, didn't you? Uh, anyway, uh, I I'm. I was talking to my son Andy uh, the other, just uh, well yesterday or what is today? This Thursday. It was either Tuesday or Wednesday, and uh, he said uh, he he was reminded uh, that I was here this week, and he goes, "Oh yeah." He says those are he goes those are uh, he called you sweet. He said those are sweet kids, and I said yeah. And so he had a great time here with you a few months back, uh, and uh, so forth. So he appreciated the fact that I got to be here with you as well, and I know you had a great time with him. Uh, Mr. Lavoy was talking about his favorite this or favorite that. Uh, I, uh, I hesitate to even do this because of what he just said. I think I mentioned the other day, I asked uh, some questions about uh, people in the Bible who ought to be carved into Mount Rushmore. That's what it was, into a Old Testament Mount Rushmore. And uh, in a sense, in a sense, we were kind of asking you know, somebody who might be our favorite individual from the scriptures and that sort of thing. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. But the truth is, if you push me and said, do you have a favorite person in the Bible? I would have to say, yeah, you know, I've got several. I mean, I've got, I've got a whole lot. And maybe if I ask you, do you have anybody that's a favorite? You know, somebody would stand out to you. In fact, sometimes I've asked young people, do you have a favorite Bible character? And they'll, they'll, they'll respond with one thing or another. It's amazing to me, somebody quickly will say, uh, they'll say, Job. Uh, Job's your favorite character. Well, I, I find interest in that because I think we all find a connection with a guy like Job who had truly some issues and troubles and pain and he got through it. And so we can all connect with that. But if you pushed me, to name somebody that was my favorite Bible character outside of the Lord Jesus early in that list, top, near the top of the list, would be the guy we're going to look at together today. He's in the Old Testament as well. And the fact of the matter is I'm, I'm pausing as I go through this because I know that when I start talking about this individual, you're going to sense, Really? I already know. I already know so much <laughs> about this guy. I mean, I've heard about this guy for years, and uh, you know, really, I, I don't know that there's anything about him that I can hear today that I've not heard before. That's possibly true. And on top of that, we're going to take a look at the story that stands out above any of the other stories in this guy's life. He's one of those individuals that we see his life from his youth all the way up into his adult years. There are a few people in the scriptures that we get their childhood all the way up to their adult years. Guys like Samuel, Daniel, and David. He's the one. David was the one that his life example teaches us so much. And I suppose if I ask you, and I'm not, but if I ask you what's the one big main story that stands out above all the rest, it's probably that story that you've heard since you were a wee little munchkin, you know, David slaying Goliath. You can turn to 1 Samuel 17, and forgive me, but I know that some of you may be thinking, you know, what can we learn from this story that we've not heard countless other times in our lifetime? I mean, this was one of those perfect stories, perfect stories to be told when you're a little child. When, when teachers are trying to find something to teach children the Bible, the story of David fighting Goliath is, a, is an easy story to tell. It's a great story to tell. It's another flannel graph board story to slap up on the flannel graph board. It is a, uh, it's a story that's easy, to, it's a fascinating story to tell. But I want you to be reminded of something. David is an Old Testament example of Jesus Christ. Don't ever forget this. David is an example of Jesus Christ. David stood for the rest of the nation. Now stay with me. He stood alone 
for the nation that would not face the enemy, Goliath. Jesus took our place facing the enemy, Satan, and put himself in a position to fight the enemy, and he represented us. He was our representative. He slew the enemy. So did Jesus when he died on the cross, when he rose again from the dead. David is an Old Testament example of Jesus. So in that line and in that light, you and I could never be like what David was. He was given to us as an example. He, of course, was born in a, in a line in which later on Jesus would be born in the line of the bloodline of David. Jesus was called the Son of God, Son of Man, and Son of David. And yet, David recognized that his position was one of being, he needed to be submissive to the God that would be born through his bloodline. All right, now stay with me. I'm going somewhere with this. David also gives us an example of a life to live that I want you to see here this morning. Now again, we're going to read here in just a moment from 1 Samuel 17. But what in the world could I tell you about this story that you've not heard a thousand times or more? You know, young people, you can hear a story like this so many times that you almost think that it didn't really happen. You may even begin to think it was made for TV drama. You think it was almost something that was put in a children's book. Did you ever have one of those uh, books called the Golden Readers, those little Golden Reader books? You know, maybe some of you are still at that level of reading. Uh, you know, and you, maybe you had one that was written that was, showed you the story of David fighting Goliath. Or maybe you had a picture in your children's Bible of David killing, facing Goliath. I had a picture in my children's Bible, and I can still remember it. Because again, I'd sit in church and sometimes my pastor would be preaching and I wouldn't be able to follow what he was teaching and preaching on. And I'd be sitting there. And so I'd flip through my children's Bible and I would, uh, I'd run, I remember seeing that picture. And it bothers me now what was in that picture because the picture pictured uh, a little boy because it was a children's Bible. Some artist had depicted this little boy. He looked like he was like maybe eight years old. Well, David was not eight it was this, this picture I had was a little chunky little eight-year-old boy out there, you know, little shepherd boy, had a little shepherd boy outfit on, had his name on the back, Davy, you know, and he was just standing there, had this little sling in his hand. And then Goliath was on the other side of this picture, and Goliath, according to the, the, uh, the imagery of the picture in my children's Bible, Goliath looked like he might have been as big as uh, six foot two. That, that, that's, that is totally inaccurate, completely off track. Uh, students of this passage have taken the numbers that have been given about the size of Goliath and they have differed as to exactly how tall Goliath was, but they all agree he was at least, minimum, nine foot six. One commentator I read believes he could have been as tall as 12 feet. This is the kind of guy you want your basketball team right here. I mean, he's 9, 6 to 12 feet, all right? You say, well, wh wh how tall do you think he was? I, I, I don't I just think he was a freak. That's all I know. I mean, it's this guy, he was this massive human being. His armor, the armor that he was wearing, was anywhere between <coughs> 200 to 300 pounds. He was wearing that. Now, I don't know how much this organ weighs, you know, it could, it could be anywhere between two to 300 pounds, I suppose. Can you imagine one person coming up here and just picking it up and walking around with it? I mean, think about this. Goliath was wearing armor that weighed that much. He was, a, he was not normal, okay? He was just not normal. And David, David was a teenager, and he was, because he was old enough to take care of his daddy's sheep out, in the, out by himself alone, he could have been anywhere between, say, 13, 14, all the way to maybe 17, something like that. He was not quite old enough to serve in the army of Israel. His brothers, he had three brothers who fought in the army of Israel, but David was not old enough to fight in that army. So, here you go. You've got this teenage boy. 
And he goes out and he faces this giant. Now, I know, again, you know the story. David is out there taking care of his sheep one day, and his daddy said, uh, calls him in, David! You know, like big old farmland, ranch land. You had to yell to be heard, and David comes in. Yes, sir? Son, I haven't heard anything about your brothers. They're out there fighting with uh, Saul, King Saul, and uh, uh, we hadn't heard anything and, uh, for quite a while. It's been over a month. Hadn't got any news about it, and we want to, I, I need to know if your boys are, if my brother, if your brothers, our boys, are okay. I need you to get up in the morning and take these sandwiches and these Cheetos to them, and I want you to go out there and enjoy a meal with them, find out, get a report, and come back. We're going to read in a moment. David got up early in the morning and left the sheep with somebody else's care, and he took off, and he, he went up to see his brothers. He's out there. They're sitting around there eating uh, pizza slices or they're eating whatever and they're enjoying a meal and uh, and all of a sudden out comes this monstrous freak of a mountain man he comes out and he bellows out across this valley now look young people this really happened I know that you've heard it all your life and it seems like a picture from a children's book or a flannel graph board but you can imagine the sound of this monstrous man bellowing out across this valley I mean picture the Philistine army over here up here on this mountainside, on this hillside, and for 40 days, now this is the 40th day, this man comes out, and he's just standing out here, and he's yelling across because he's got this big valley, and over here on the other side, you've got the, the people, the army of Israel, up on this mountainside over here. And you can see guys looking around trees and maybe uh, kind of ducking them down behind some tree limbs and that sort of thing, and they're seeing this guy step out, and he says, send me one man. Just send me one man. No need for everybody to fight. Just send me one man and we'll, we'll fight. If he happens to kill me, ha <laughs> ha, fat chance. He says, if he kills me, then the Philistines will be your servants. By the way, that was a lie. Because when Goliath did get defeated and he was killed, the Philistines didn't put down their swords and say, we're here to serve you. No. And we're going to read it again. They took off running in the opposite direction. And then Goliath said, but if I kill who whatever soldier you send out, then you become our servants. This has gone on for 39 days. Here we are for the 40th day. Goliath didn't expect anything to change. David's over here eating a meal with his buddy, with his brothers, and uh, everything's going fine. They're, getting, they're, they're talking about what's been going on, but there's not been a battle going on. And David hears this voice, and David thinks, wait a minute, wait a minute. This guy has no business talking about our God this way. Well, he has no business carrying on like that. He says, who's going to fight him? Well, David, we got this figured out. No, you don't. I'll take him. David goes to see the king. Listen, you're talking thousands of men. Thousands, maybe. Let's say, let's just say 10,000. They're, they're hidden up there on the hillside. You're talking trained soldiers. And David goes to the king and he says, I'll take him. He said, I, I can do it. He goes, look, I killed a bear once. Also, I killed a lion once. So I was out taking care of my daddy's sheep. You know something? We never read that in the scriptures. We never, we never heard about his killing of a bear and a lion, except for the fact that David had to use it as an explanation that I can take care of that guy. I can take care of Goliath. I killed a bear once. Isn't that something? I mean, I mean think of it. You say, yeah, ah, bah, ah. Do you think maybe it was a little cub of a bear and maybe a small lion? Number one, who cares what size that animal was? Number two, I really don't think that. I think that David out there in the middle taking care of sheep in the middle of nowhere with nobody watching him, he said, you can't have that sheep. That belongs to my dad. He went over. Can you imagine? He, he didn't have any scoreboard. Nobody was taking pictures. There's no scoreboard. You know, David won. Bears, zero. You know, I mean, there, was no, there were no cheerleaders. Go, David, go. Go, David, go. Go. David. You know, none of that was going on. David said, I, nobody was taking pictures for a, a, a yearbook picture. Nobody was uh, saying, this is great. We're going to put this in the, in the papers. David just did what was right with nobody even watching him. And he killed a bear. He killed a lion. He said, I'll take it. And all through the process, David gives, finally convinces the king, I'll take him out there, and he goes out there, and he, and he faces him. Now, now, fellas, don't get upset with me, but just think about this. David was a young teenage boy. Who knows? And I'm having troubles with my voice, so I don't know if I can convey this. Who knows? Maybe, maybe David was uh, going through that 
stage, that age that some of you may be going through, and a lot of you guys have passed through, where your voice plays games with you, you know? And Goliath could have said, send me a man. What is this over here? And David could have looked out over across that valley and he said, hey, you come to me with a sword and a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. You don't know? Maybe he did that, you know? When you're going through that as a guy, girls don't, don't give guys a hard time. Your, your body is going through changes, you just don't know, and all of a sudden it cracks on you, and it just plays games with you. It could have been. And Goliath would have looked out across the way, and he says, what have I got, a boy or a girl over there? What in the world? What kind of voice is that? I mean, it could have happened. It could have happened. This really happened. And David said, make fun of me all you want to, but I'm taking your head off. Now, now look. You ever gone into a ball game that you're a little nervous about? You ever gone to play an instrument in front of the people at a concert and you're a little nervous about it? Can you imagine? Can you imagine facing this giant soldier? And you're out there as a teenager and you got this sling. How in the world? Look, don't get the idea that, you know, David was just blessed with some extra courage. David went with something else, and I'm going to show you in just a moment. Takes that sling. Now, can you imagine the Philistines over here on this side of the, of the valley, over there, they're looking down, they're going, look at this, this is hilarious. This is, they're laughing, their heads off, and this is all Israel's got. They got a little teenage kid out there. This is a joke. I mean, they're just, they're falling up next to each other. This is so hilarious. Israel over here, <coughs> they're over here. On their, they're, they're thinking, ay, 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 ay. Is this all we got? Is this all we got down there facing the... And, this is, and his brothers were humiliated. They're saying, David, get back up here. Come back up here. What are we going to tell daddy? He's, you're going to you know, remember the neighborhood. Remember the family name. Come back up here. And David faces that giant and he gets that sling going. And the Philistines are going, woo, look at this. Woo, 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 a sling. This is really tough. And the, and the Israelites are saying, oh, man, not even a sword, no kind of a, a protection of a shield or anything. Oh, man, this is embarrassing. Now, look, I don't know if you've ever gone to a, a professional ball game. When you watch a ball game like baseball on TV, you see that baseball being released from a pitcher being thrown 96, 97 miles an hour. The cameras pick it up. There's just a little blur there. When you're actually way up in the stadium at an actual ball game, when that pitcher hauls off and throws it, you again see just a little blur, but you really can't see much about it. David had a stone that was not even the size of a baseball, and probably when it was released from that sling, it was probably going faster than that, maybe over 100 miles an hour. I don't know, but I mean, it was being released with some force. I doubt if any of the Philistines over here, I doubt if any of the Israelites saw that stone release. They just saw the sling released, and all of a sudden they see this, this, this monstrous man begin to... The Bible says he falls face forward, which is kind of unusual. You'd think he got hit in the forehead, he'd fall backwards. I don't know. You think maybe there might have been an angel behind him that said, kaboom, you know, I mean, I'm not real sure. But all of a sudden, this giant of a man, kaboom, and man, dust and everything flies out on either side of this monstrous body. Folks, listen, I think there, you could have heard a pin drop. This guy who's been scaring people for 40 days, the Philistines are going, what, what just happened? going on down there maybe somebody said you know what's happening you know what's going on Goliath is is playing possum he's going to bring that little kid up close and as soon as that kid comes up close he's going to roll over and take his sword and he's going to wipe him out just watch watch I think that's what's going on the Israelites are over there going what, what just took place I mean this guy's been scaring us for days what what's going on here What's the deal here? And then the Bible tells us that David takes off running. Now, why did he run? Because even though I'm just kind of taking a few steps, there was a great deal of distance. By the way, David was good with that sling. It wasn't luck. No angel grabbed that rock coming out of his sling and 
thud into Goliath's head. David was good. Uh, David worked at what he could do. He's out there taking care of sheep, and he probably played with that sling and hit trees and telephone poles and who knows what all. I mean, he's out there taking care of things. And, uh, and, so, uh, he, and so David hit, hit Goliath square in the forehead, and the que- no question about it, Goliath has been knocked out. David takes off running, and he jumps over, and he jumps on top of the body of this giant. And he's got a lot of land to cover, this big, huge, huge human being. He's walking around. Probably David's brothers are saying, David, 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 come back. Come back. You don't know where that man's been. Don't touch him. You know, come back up here. And David goes over, and he grabs Goliath's sword, and he pulls it out. Because Goliath hadn't even pulled out his own sword. He pulls it out, and it's probably it's so big. The Bible tells us it's the biggest sword in the Old Testament history of time. He takes out his sword. He may have his hands may have uh, shook a little bit as he tried to bring it under control, and he hovers over the neck of that giant. And probably the Philistines are thinking, you know, Goliath, if you're playing, it's probably a good time for you to just kind of flip over. Now, this might be a good time for you to get things turned around. Come on, Goliath. Come on, Goliath. Wake up. And David goes over. Now, look, I don't know if this sword, I don't want to gross you out. I don't know if this sword was razor sharp. I mean, you got a very thick bone back here. I mean, I don't know if it was just one whack. (laughs) Or maybe it was more of a... I mean, I don't know. But eventually, he gets that head severed off the shoulders and neck of that guy, and he reaches down and grabs whatever hair the man had, and he literally pulls that head up right there. You talk about the symbol of victory. Took his head off. Again, I'm just thinking about what Jesus did for us. He holds that head up in the middle of the valley, and the Philistines are going, <laughs> put it back, put his head back on. And, and the Israelites are saying, yep, we got him. And his brothers are saying, you know, I've been working with him about that sling business. You know, I've been kind of talking to him. I, I want us to read it. Would you go, 1 Samuel 17. I know you know the story, but go back with me. Would you look at verse, let's start in verse 41. It says, and the Philistine came on and he drew near unto David. And the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was just a youth. He was but a youth. And he was ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? That means a walking stick. In other words, David was still a a developing skinny body. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I'll give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand. Listen to this guy's comment. And I will smite thee and take thine head from thee and I'll give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took thence a stone, and slang it, and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and he smote the Philistine, and he slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. Now look at this. (coughs) And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, 
they fled. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines. And he goes on to talk about how far they went. One teenage boy came into the environment, and when the victory was won, the enemy took off running. I just read it to you. God's people got new courage and said, let's go after them, boys. Let's go. One, listen, one teenage guy changed the entire environment to give confidence to God's people and to help defeat the enemy. What in the world has that got to do with me and you? I've said it twice. Let me say it a third time. David represents the Lord Jesus in the victory that he won for us. But I want you to see a secondary principle here, and it's this. David was a teenage guy that changed the environment within which he lived. You know what I've discovered through the years? Every church youth group, every Christian school, every environment in which there are a group of young people is usually in desperate need of some Davids. Some guys, some girls who take such a position, take such a stance that it infuses confidence <coughs> among the rest of God's people. And it helps to defeat the enemy. I've seen it happen. I've been associated in my own personal ministry with two different church youth ministries. I directed a Christian camp and I had youth groups come and go all the time. I was associated with two Christian schools. I've been around a lot of young people down through the generations. I'm going to tell you something. You can always sense when there's a young man, a young lady, who believes God for all that he is and stands up so strongly for him that it infects the rest of the group. You see, most of us are, we're more comfortable with just kind of blending in with everybody else and not really being too bold in our position. I don't mean, there's no room for rudeness here. I'm not talking about being a kind of a person that is cocky. There's no arrogance on the part of David. There's no sense of, if y'all listen to me, we'll go places. No, there's nothing like that going on. David had an effective testimony that influenced the people of his day, and as I said the other day, it still lives on to this day. As I said before, he's considered the greatest king Israel's ever had. And they still in Israel speak of the star of David. What was it that made David the champion that he was? What can you and I learn from the life of this young man that we ought to see ought to be developed in our own life? It may surprise you. What made David the leader, the spiritual leader that he was? Well, go all the way back to verse, I think it's verse 17. Go all the way back to the early part, maybe it's verse 15. I want you to see the first thing here. Yeah, verse 15. But David went and he returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Stop right there. David had been to see the king, King Saul, to play his musical instrument, his harp, because King Saul was in a, a great deal of distress, and David played music to help soothe and comfort the king. Now listen, young people, that was a, that was a pretty tall gig. I mean, that was, a, that was a great honor to be able to go play before the king. David comes home. Maybe he's got some gifts from the gift shop, from the palace. And I mean, he's walking in the door and, and he's telling the family what it was like to see the king and so forth and how special it was. And his daddy says, oh, that's fine. Put the harp up. I need you to take care of the sheep. That's what the Bible says. He came home and he just took care of the sheep, which was not that glamorous or glorious of a job. It was hard work. It was a stinky job. It was nothing special about it. The Bible says he went home and he took care of his daddy's sheep. Now look at verse 17. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren a, an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp to your brethren. Carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand and look how thy brethren fare and take their pledge. And look at verse 20. And David rose up early in the morning and he left the sheep with a keeper and he took and he went, don't miss this, as Jesse had commanded him. His dad said, get up in the morning, take these sandwiches, 
and go see how your brothers are doing. Check with their captains and find out, and then come back and give me the report. Now listen, let me tell you what made David a great leader and a great winner in front of everybody else. Are you ready for this? He was submissive to the leaders in his life, to the leadership of his life. He was right with his parents. He was obedient. He was honoring to his leaders at home. You tell me how things are for you between you and your parents, and I can almost write the next chapters of your life. Tell me how you're getting along with dad and how you're getting along with mom, and I can tell you the direction of your life. I don't mean this in an unkind way. I'm just telling you I've seen it so many times. Now look, where every single person is seated, I know there's a different story in every single home. I told this to the parents that were here last night. There are no perfect parents. They don't exist. So when a guy like me stands up and says, tell me how you're getting along with dad and mom, the natural inclination of your thoughts are, you just don't know my parents. No, I don't. I mean, I don't really know them. I don't know what they're like behind closed doors. I don't know what it's been like to be raised in your home. Maybe, maybe, maybe you just live with one parent, single parent. I mean, I don't know. I don't know about any of this. <coughs> maybe you've been adopted and you don't even know your biological parents or maybe you've met them. I've met young people that are raised by their grandparents. I don't know your housing home situation. I just know this. There are no perfect homes because your parents are made out of the same flesh that you're made out of. But David was able to stand up and face this giant. Listen, he was able to face the enemy be, and he was able to be a leader among God's people and make a difference in the world he found himself in because he was right with his parents at home. David, go take care of the sheep. Yes, sir. David, in the morning, take these sandwiches and go see your brothers. Yes, sir. He did what he was supposed to do. Let me ask you, just point blank. How are you getting along with dad and mom? It's not a joking matter, it really isn't. How many times do you have to be told to do something before you obey? What kind of spirit do you obey with? You do what you're told to do, but your heart is kind of angry when you're told to do it. When parents speak to you about something that's uncomfortable, do your eyes roll back in your head like, get a life, Dad. You ever found yourself texting a friend saying, I just can't believe my parents. I can't believe what they tell me. You ever get a text from a friend that sends something like that to you? How do you respond to that? Do you go back and help feed and fuel the fire? Yeah, I tell your parents to get off. No, if you ever got something like that from a friend, to be a real friend, you need to say, hey, 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 hey can we talk? Give me a call. And say to your friend, come on, man. I know your dad's not perfect. You don't know what he's going through. I know your, your mom may not be she may not be feeling well. Come on, man. Remember what the Bible says. Be a friend. You could have interviewed David out there and said, hey, you're going to kill this giant? Yeah, I'm going to take his head off. <laughs> That's pretty confident. Well, I, I just know that God's going to honor what I've been doing. Well, what is it you've been doing? David would have said to you, I obey my parents at home. And you, would have st you sit here and you go, what in the world does obeying parents at home have to do with slaying giants. He's got everything in the world, and David knew it. He said, what do you mean? David knew the command of scriptures. Children, obey your parents and the Lord. It was one of the Ten Commandments. Obey your parents and the Lord, for it's right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Listen to this. That it may be well with thee. David could have said, things are going to go well for me because I'm right with my parents. I know you struggle at times with boundaries. But you know your, your life has always been filled with boundaries and you're going to always have boundaries. You always will. I mean, when you came home from the hospital, a little newborn, little hunk of flesh, your parents put you in a baby bed. You ever taken a look at those baby beds? 
They've got walls around them. They've got bars. They're little prisons. That's what they are. And you see a couple of kids in the church nursery saying, we're breaking out tonight, Jake. You know, I mean, now the truth is, I mean, when you're a baby, you're put inside that little baby bed for your protection. Those walls are up. Now, it doesn't bother you anymore because you've gone past those. I've seen many a baby stomp and cry and hang on to the top and screaming and carrying on because they want out. It's just something about boundaries that kids don't like. Then they put you in a room and then they put a little over by the door. They put one of those little gates, or little springy gates. It's just tall enough for a kid can't step over it and get out and go to another room. He's, his, his boundaries have increased, but he's still got boundaries. And then he gets to play in the backyard. That's got a fence around it, you know. Then he gets a bicycle and he can ride down the street to one corner and turn around and come right back. And, and then you become a teenager and you say, Can I can I go to can I go to Willie's house? Uh, I don't know. Who's gonna be there? I don't know. Well, what are you gonna do when you get there? I don't know. Just hang out. Well, what does hang out mean? I don't know. You're going to watch a video, movie? Probably. What's it going to be? I don't know. There going to be any other people there? Any other girls? Any other guys? I don't know. Will Willie's parents be there? I probably. I don't know. No. Parents say, you know, I just don't think I can let you go. Uh, 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 I can't do anything. No. You've always had boundaries. Those boundaries are for your protection. You say, my parents, they just, they won't let me do anything. No, your parents have always tried to do what they can to protect you from harm. You say, yeah, but if you knew my parents, no, I, I'm not talking to them, I'm not preaching to them. I preached to them last night. I'm telling you right now, David was a winner because he was submissive at home. And then there's one more thing. Not only was he submissive to leadership, now stay with me. Here's the way I put it. He was saturated with the Lord. Just, just for your reminder, did you see how many times David referred to the Lord? Go back with me real quickly, chapter 17. Look at verse 36. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. David was concerned about God's testimony. Verse 37, David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he'll deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. Look at verse 45. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. Verse 46. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand. Look at the very last sentence of verse 46. All the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Next verse. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saves not with sword and with spear, for the battle is the Lord's. Now, young people, there's no question here that David knew the Lord, ready, intimately. He knew him strongly. And I'm not just talking about knowing him as Savior. If I ask you, do you know the Lord Jesus? I'm going to guess that every one of you could say, yes, I've accepted the Lord. I trust that's true. If it's not, you need help. We need to help you. David knew the Lord as a Savior, but David knew the Lord as Lord, his master. He knew the Lord so well, are you ready for this, that he could say, I'm taking that, that guy's head off, and he even told the, the giant, I'm taking your head off because the Lord, I know him. I've seen what he can do. Is the Lord nothing more but a biblical fact to you to help you in Bible class? <clears throat> is the Lord just something that you've heard about all your life? Someone you sing about? I'd rather have Jesus. You just know about it. If I said to you, tell me what you know about the Lord Jesus, would you just be simply saying, uh, let's see here, uh, he is he's omnipotent. That is true. He is omnipotent. That's good. 
And somebody else would say, uh, he's also omniscient. He knows everything. That's true. Somebody else would say, he's omnipresent. Whew, I got one in. Yeah, he's everywhere. Somebody else would say, well, I know some more things. He's immutable. What does that mean? I don't know. It means he doesn't change. You say, I know some facts about God. Good. Now, how well do you know him? It's like if you asked me to describe my wife to you, I could, I could give you some facts. I could tell you she's five foot one with shoes on. I could tell you the size of uh, her ring finger. I could tell you the size of clothes that she wears. I could tell you what kind of what size of a hat she would wear if she wears a hat. I could tell you her favorite foods. She would probably agree with Mr. Lavoie. Whatever's in front of me, I am ready to eat. I can tell you her favorite color. It's pink. I can tell you some favorite things about her. So, do you really know my wife? No. You just got a bunch of facts. But son, listen, I've known my wife for a long time. I can, I can call her right now, and the way she answers the phone, I can tell you what's, basically, I can tell you, She's busy reading something, or if I caught her while she's trying to get dressed for the day or something, I can almost, sometimes I'll call if I'm out of town and I can tell she's out shopping. Ooh, that worries me. How much money am I spending? And uh, I, can, I can tell you things, I can tell you things about her just by hearing her voice or the expression of her face. Why? Because come on, man, we've been together since we both got off the ark with Noah. I mean, we've been together for years. I know her. How does that happen? Because of time spent. If I said to you, thanks for the facts about God, how well do you know him? You say, well, how do I get to know him? By spending time with him. I'm not just talking about reading the Bible, having a little time in every morning and check off another day. Okay, I read, I read the word of God. That's good. But you need to be hearing his voice talking to you. You know, I'm afraid that if David lived today, I wonder if we would have gotten some of the psalms that we have. He'd been out there taking care of the sheep. If he lived today, it wouldn't have been that he'd look at the sheep and he'd start thinking, hmm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want for anything. He makes me to lie down in green pastures and restores my soul. If he lived today, I'm afraid he'd be out there going, <coughs> hey, dude, <coughs> what's up where you are? Me? Oh, nothing, man. I'm just taking care of these dumb sheep. He said, what's wrong with texting? Nothing. I, use it just, I just use it every day, several times a day. But I wonder... Do you know what it is to spend time quietly alone with God? Do you? David was used of God, listen, because he was submissive to leaders, basically was right with his dad and mom. And he was saturated with the Lord. You're just going to be another kid in the school and the academy and graduate and they'll say, hey, yeah, I remember that kid. Yeah, I remember or will you be somebody that in the years to come, they'll say, you know something? She impacted our, she impacted our school. You know something? He, he made a difference in that class because of his spirit toward leadership and his submissiveness and saturation with the Lord. Let me tell you this. Beauty of a life is not just exterior. It starts on the inside and it comes on the outside. You make things right with God from the inside, it'll show on the outside. Let's bow our heads for prayer. You want to be a David? Or will this chapel service just be another service you put in a little time and heard an interesting little story and an encounter of David? 
Or do you want to be the kind of person that genuinely is a part of impacting your world like David did? Would you talk to your God right now? Why don't you pray something like this? Dear Lord, I want to know you more than ever. I want to get to know you. Please reveal yourself to me. Tell him. Reveal yourself to me, Lord. Let me know. Let me be a person who's growing in my walk with you. Lord, I pray for these young people. I pray that you'll raise up David's the kind of testimonies that need to be a part of our lives. I pray that you'll help this school to be impacted by some, yes, wonderful, sweet young people, but young people who genuinely are close to you and getting closer to you all the time. May it be seen in classrooms, may it be seen at home, may it be seen in life. We ask it in your beautiful name. Amen. Thank you. We'll see you around. Take care.